we are going to go into the opening keynote, um, which is by Tessa Lau, uh, entitled Building Dusty Robotics. I have lost my bio here, one second. <laughs> so Tessa, um, so I, I worked with Tessa at IBM um, a few years ago now, um, but Tessa is, is now the CEO of Dusty Robotics, um, an experienced op you know, entrepreneur with an expertise in AI, machine learning and robotics. Um, and now she's created Dusty Robotics, whose mission is to improve the construction industry productivity by introducing robotic automation on the job site. Um, prior to Dusty, she was CTO co-founder at Savvy Oak um, and you know, research scientist in Willow Garage. And before that, spent 11 years at IBM Research. Uh, and also was recommend, recognized relatively recently in 2018 as one of the top five innovative women to watch in robotics um, by Inc., uh, the magazine, uh, and holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Washington. So Tessa, uh, I will stop sharing here, allow you to share, and please take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Or I can hear you. And can you see my screen? Not yet, but kind of, yes, now I can. Okay, awesome. Just get my window set up here. Okay, so super excited to be here. Uh, thanks, Jeff and the entire WIS team for the opportunity to come talk to you guys today. Um, my name is Tessa Lau. I'm the founder and CEO of Dusty Robotics. And what I wanted to do today uh, with this keynote is actually tell you a story about how my career in HCI research has led me to build a successful robotics startup. Um, Dusty, if you don't know about it, uh, we're about three and a half years old. We're in the Bay Area. We're almost 30 people at this point. We've raised around $23.5 million of venture capital. And we have construction companies across the world who are clamoring for our product. Um, and the coolest thing about my job, I like to tell people, is that it's it's really a culmination of everything I've done in my career, including some time spent in the WIST, CHI, HCI communities that has brought me to this point. And so let me tell you the story about how that started and where we are and where we're going. So I started my undergrad at Cornell, uh, majoring in applied physics and computer science. I then went to the University of Washington in Seattle for my PhD, working at the intersection of AI and HCI. And my dissertation was on the topic of end user programming, a topic that many of you in the WIS community have probably heard about. At that time, I was using machine learning to recognize patterns in user behavior and predict how we could automate that behavior. After University of Washington, I went to IBM Research for 11 years, first at the TJ Watson Research Lab in upstate New York, and then later moving to the Almaden uh, Research Center for IBM in San Jose. Uh, at IBM, I was continuing the theme uh, that I started in my PhD work about end user programming through a number of research projects, many of which have been published in conferences like WIST, CHI, IUI. And my mission was to give ordinary people superpowers by making automation available to everyone. But after 11 years at IBM Research, I decided that I wanted to do something different. Um, and one of the things that I realized was that the impact that I had in software automation was limited to living behind a screen. And I wanted the opportunity to change the world. Um, and what better way to change the world than through robotics? Because robots actually live out in the real world and they touch people's lives. So my former manager, Steve Cousins, uh, who had led the, I, the HCI research group at IBM Melvin, he had left IBM a couple of years prior to start a robotics research lab called Willow Garage. And one of the research projects uh, that he was running at Willow was an effort that was called Robots for Humanity. Uh, robots for Humanity uh, was a research project where robotics researchers were working with a paralyzed quadriplegic, Henry Evans, and that's him right there, um, and Henry was unable to perform activities of daily living. He was being cared for by his wife, Jane, uh, and he couldn't do things like feed himself or even scratch his nose when he, when he was itchy. And so what was really inspiring was that with the help of this Robots for Humanity team, Henry was actually able to control a humanoid PR2 robot to do some of these tasks for himself. And after 10 years, he was finally able to scratch his own nose and to shave himself, which is what you're seeing here, through programming a robot that could actually move around and actually help himself do these tasks. So that was incredibly empowering for Henry and it was really inspiring for me. And what it made me see is that robots really have the potential to impact people's lives, unlike software, which lives behind a screen. And so I decided to leave uh, IBM and come work for Willow Garage. And 
as I worked at Willow, I watched, I didn't know anything about robotics. And I, and I watched these roboticists program robots and, and make them do their thing using code and non-user friendly interfaces. And coming from an HCI background, I was horrified. And so I said, okay, I'm going to change that. I want to democratize robotics and I want to make it possible for ordinary people to be able to take advantage of some of the power of these complex uh, robotic tools and be able to make use of them in their daily lives. I wanted to work on end user robot programming. Um, unfortunately, after a year, Willow Garage went out of business. And so Steve and I and a couple other people from Willow Garage decided to start a startup to commercialize some of the technology we developed at Willow and bring it out into the world. And we called that company Savvy Oak. So as a CTO and chief robot whisperer at Savvy Oak, I led our team to create autonomous robo mobile robots that would deliver room service to guests staying in hotels. Uh, we built this robot, and, uh, it's named Relay, and what it would do is uh, take the elevators autonomously, drive down the hallway, call your room phone, and bring you a sandwich, uh, all without any human intervention. Um, and what I was doing with that robot was taking everything I knew about human computer interaction, which is now human robot interaction, and using it to design a user-friendly robot that would interact with people in a very dense urban environment like a hotel and allow regular people to interact with the system and program it to do what they wanted it to do. Um, unfortunately, after five years at Savvy Oak, uh, the robots weren't taking off. And so I decided to take what I'd learned about robots and startups and start building a new company from scratch. And that company uh, became Dusty. But what would my new company do? Well, at the time that I started Dusty, I was remodeling my house, and this is what it looked like. Uh, if you've ever had the misfortune of living on a construction site, this is, it's very unpleasant. Um, and I had contractors coming to my door every single morning, holding hand tools, doing manual labor. And I realized that every building that we inhabit, all the walls around you, the roofs over your head, everything that we do in our lives uh, is a product of the construction industry. And all of these products are still being built by hand by a skilled workforce of construction professionals who are assembling these buildings bit by bit using manual labor. And so as a roboticist, I thought here's an opportunity to use robotics to actually change this industry for the better by introducing automation into one of the oldest industries on the planet. But what do we do? So I bought a hard hat and some steel toed boots and I started walking around on construction sites and I talked to everyone I could trying to form an understanding of the industry and really wrap my head around what some of these challenges are in construction and where could robots help. Um, and it turns out that the process of starting a company and doing customer discovery is very similar to ethnographic research in HCI. Without understanding the context in which tools are being used, it's very hard to design new technology that fits in with existing people's workflow. And that might be one of the main reasons why startups fail. So I wanted to understand the pain points that the construction industry faced so that I could design a solution that would fit in seamlessly with existing work practice, um, help people do their jobs faster and better, and uh, not make the mistake of starting with a technology and then working backwards to the pain point and finding a problem that that technology solves. So my research project. Uh, so I started asking people, what would they like a robot to automate? And I walked around on these sites and there's lots and lots of people. I think the most busy site I was on had maybe 2000 people on it at any given time. And I talked to as many of them as I could. And I said, what would you like a robot to do for you? But I quickly found that everyone wanted a different thing. I would ask 10 people and I get 12 different ideas. And all of those robots were probably complex humanoid robots that are probably not going to be possible to build in the next couple of decades. So, these people that I was talking to, they're construction professionals. They know a huge amount of construction, but they didn't know anything about robotics and automation and technology. So they couldn't tell me what was possible and they couldn't project out what might be possible in the next year or two. So uh, what I did instead of asking people what they wanted was I said, okay, I'm going to come up with some ideas and you tell me, is this a good idea or not? And so I would ask people, you know, what do you think of this idea? I could build a robot that would do this for you. But the problem with that approach is that no one wants to tell you your idea sucks. They are never going to give you an honest answer about whether that's a good idea or not, because they're looking you straight in the eye and they don't want to, to give you bad news. So what I ended up doing was following a different approach. 
also based on HCI methodology, which is A-B testing. Everyone knows about that. So what I would do is I would pick two ideas. I would say, what about this robot or what about this robot? And I would ask people to compare those ideas and say, which one's better? Which one do you like better? And no one wants to say one of those ideas is bad, but they're happy to tell you this one's a better idea than that one. And so by iterating through a number of different ideas using this A-B testing methodology, we were able to test out a number of ideas on our prospective customers and figure out which ones might actually work for them. So along the way, I did a lot of research on related work. Uh, so this is my traditional related work slide. It's a little bit different in format, but there are a number of companies in the construction robotic space and each one is tackling a slightly different problem. And so I came up with this market map to organize my thinking about where each of these companies fit into the landscape. Uh, it's a little bit old. I did this back in 2018. So there's some more companies available now. There are some that have gone out of business, unfortunately, but it's, it's still mostly accurate. Um, and what you see here is that most of construction is divided up into individual trades. So these are specially trained workforces that each do one thing really, really well. For example, digging holes, placing concrete, or building walls. Those are the vertical boxes in this map of the market here. And many of the construction robotics companies I found were in, located in one of these vertical boxes and trying to automate one of those trades. So they were basically trying to build a robot that would do as well as a human worker, uh, one, a very skilled human worker that had trained for years to become an expert in one of those trades. And they were looking to automate that through robotics. There were also a number of companies uh, that were mostly in software that were building tools that spanned multiple trades. That's the horizontal boxes in this market map. And the nice thing about one of these horizontal box companies is that they're building tools that span multiple trades. So instead of just having one set of people that could actually make use of your technology, suddenly maybe a large number of people on the job site can actually make use of your technology and that increases your value. That means that there's more potential things you can do for the stakeholders in your space. So it's higher value but it's also a much more crowded space because there are a lot of companies that are trying to do that. But I thought, you know, what other applications are there that could benefit multiple different trades on site? Um, and could there be a robot that could actually fall into one of these horizontal boxes, span multiple trades and solve problems, not just for one of these vertical trades, but maybe for all of them. So, one of the things that we came up with, and this is the, the penultimate idea that we came up with, was automating a task that happens on every single job site. Uh, and it has to be done by every single trade, and that's cleanup. On every single job site I walked, there was always at least one person, usually several people, pushing brooms around, cleaning the debris off the site, sweeping it up, and getting it out of the way. Um, and I talked to people, and I said, you know, how important is that? You know, it, and I found that it's actually kind of important. A uh, clean site is a safe site. It's an efficient site. Everyone knows when they walk onto a floor and they look at the condition of the floor, if it's beautiful and pristine, then it's probably a very well-run job. People care about their work and they're probably going to finish the project faster, cheaper, because everything's organized. You can kind of tell when you walk onto a site. And so I started asking, well, what if we could build a robot that would do this automatically, keep the site clean overnight? And I tested it on several of our contacts in the construction industry. And they thought, yeah, you know, that, that could work. I could imagine that working. You could build a Roomba for us. Sure. Uh, it wasn't a breakthrough, but they could see it working. And so we decided to collect some requirements. So my, that's me uh, holding a broom right there. We spent a couple of days pushing brooms around on job sites. Uh, we wanted to understand what would such a robot do? What would it have to pick up? What would it have to sweep? Uh, we brought a scale and a measuring device, AKA a cardboard box to the site in order to measure the volume and the density of the stuff that we would have to pick up in order to create the requirements for a robot that we might be able to build in order to solve this problem for, for customers. But a funny thing happened as we were sweeping. We started looking at the ground and we noticed that there are all these marks on the ground with precise details about there's nomenclature, there's measurements, there's dimensions. And uh, we started asking people, well, what, are these, what are these things? Where did they come from? And that's when we learned about layout. I saw, I started looking more carefully and talking to people about layout and what this is. And I saw tables on every single job site with stacks of paper plans, each one containing a blueprint of what needed to be built where. 
Uh, I saw workers that were using measuring tape to measure out dimensions off of walls or off of columns and figure out where things went. And they would calculate dimensions using handheld calculators. And I saw people on their hands and knees. And what they would do is they'd stretch a chalk covered string between two points and then snap it. And that's how they created a straight line on the job site. So this is how layout is done today. This is how every single building in the world is built. Um, and the opportunity that we saw as we walked these sites and we started talking to people about this problem is that this task is a very manual one and it doesn't have to be. So we realized that the industry has really modernized itself in, uh, in, the, in the sense that nowadays every single building is, uh, is designed digitally in software using tools like AutoCAD or Revit um, and it's designed in full three dimensions with a lot of detail. But when the time comes to bring this information out to the field, it's still done manually by these people holding measuring tape and using string. And these people are some of the most highly paid, most highly skilled, experienced people on the job site. These are the foremen um, because they're the only ones who are experienced enough and skilled enough and smart enough to be able to figure out how do I take those plans and translate them successfully, precisely, accurately onto the floor. So not so surprisingly, anytime you have something done with manual labor, it introduces errors. And these errors can be very costly. In fact, almost 10% of a project's budget goes towards fixing errors that are made during construction. And several of those categories of errors happen during this layout process. Imagine if someone measures the wrong uh, measurement or they snap that line in the wrong place, you could end up with a wall that's in the wrong location. And sometimes those errors don't happen, don't get recognized until you're just about to turn over that building to your client. And that can be a very costly thing to fix. Not so surprisingly, uh, because this is so costly, this is costing the industry a huge amount of money. Some estimates say that just in the US alone, $128 billion a year is spent recovering from errors that are made during construction and trying to fix them. So what we decided to do at Dusty was take this and run with it. So we came up with this idea of attaching a printer to our idea of a robot vacuum cleaner and make a mobile printer that would automatically take these digital blueprints and print them on the floor of a construction site. And when I started going back to the people that had advised us and that we were talking to during this phase in the construction industry, I would tell them about this idea and their eyes would light up. They would ask, when can they buy it? And many of these people would actually even show me pictures of a prototype that they had in their garage where they took a Roomba vacuum cleaner and they tried to strap a pen to it so that they can solve this problem. And what that meant to me was that this is such a pain point for our customers that they had devoted their own time and money to trying to solve this problem. And that meant that it was a real painful problem for them. They were so invested in solving this that they really wanted to create a solution. No one was building it for them and so they tried to build it themselves and none of them were successful. So we decided to run with this. We hired a team, we raised some venture capital. And now three and a half years later, this is where we're at. Uh, what we've designed is a system that can take a fully detailed 3D model of a building uh, and bring it out into the field, making it visible to every single person on site. Uh, we call this IKEA instructions for construction. Imagine if as you're building the building, you have all of the information you need uh, accessible to you right under your toes in order to put the right part in the right place um, with extraordinary amounts of detail and eliminate the vast majority of errors that can happen during construction. Imagine if the part numbers are printed at the place where you need them, or imagine if you're installing a complex pattern of carpet tiles and you can make that as easy as paint by numbers where you put the right carpet tile in the right place. Having all of these detailed instructions out on the job site is going to make the building process virtually foolproof. So here's how it works. Uh, this is a video of our uh, system in action. This is actually about six months old at this point and startups move fast. So this is our second generation. We're currently on our third. Uh, so the three main components of the system are the total station, which you saw there on the tripod. There's the robot itself, which you're seeing here, and there's a tablet that our operators hold, and that allows them to control the system as it's operating. Um, what the system does is it takes CAD drawings, which are 2D uh, dimensioned drawings full of line work, and prints them full size on the deck of a construction site. Um, as the robot's going, it's automatically calculating the optimal path to get from point A to point B. 
Uh, it's capable of working in adverse conditions, such as near the edge of, of the floor, where it's dangerous for people to operate. And it creates a digital record at all times of what it's doing and uploads that information in the, into the cloud so that people can have a real-time understanding of what exactly is being printed and where. Um, and so what we're doing with the system is working with a large number of trades across the construction industry in order to take those digital models that they're already creating and uh, turning them into buildable, constructible models that are out there available on their job site. So how well does it work? Uh, well, if this were a traditional research talk, I'd have some slides here with the results of experiments that we've run to compare our solution against the state of the art and show how much better we are. I don't have those. Um, and that's primarily because once people start using our solution, they don't wanna go back. And so it's hard for us to get a manual layout process to compare to because no one wants to go back to the old way of doing things after they've experienced the joy that is robotic layout. But we do have some numbers from one of the first projects we did last fall, and this was with an early version of our system. It's gotten better since now, since then. And uh, this was a 13-story multifamily residential project. And Dusty was hired to lay out all of the walls on every floor of the building. And by the time we hit the top of the building, it was pretty clear what the value prop of our system was going to be for our clients. Uh, so with the traditional uh, approach, our clients allocated five days per floor of a two-man crew to actually do all of the layout of all of the apartments on that floor. That's 10 man days of effort. Uh, with Dusty, we deployed a crew of two people, two robots, and we were able to finish that job in a single day. That's an 80% schedule compression, and that's huge time savings in construction. Because in construction, time is money, and everyone knows that the faster you can turn over a project, the more money you can start making off of it. But because we had actually spent so little time on layout, our client was able to do the same work with fewer people. Because imagine if you had so many days to do the work, you might need so many people, but if you had more days, you could take a fewer number of people over a more, longer number of time, longer amount of time, and have them do the same amount of work. So our client was able to save uh, in terms of the labor costs of actually completing the, the building of the walls on this project. They went from a 50-man crew down to a 36-man crew. Um, and because of the time savings, the labor savings, and also the fact that just the system was so accurate that they didn't make any mistakes, uh, they were able to report somewhere between a 20 to 50% increase in the bottom line off of, of, of this project. Um, and that's huge. There's no other technology that they had ever heard of that allowed them to save this much money on a single project. And it was all thanks to Dusty. And the main thing that they told us at the end of this job was that the, mir the miraculous thing about using Dusty was that everything just fit. By the time they got to the end of the project, all of the pieces went in perfectly. They didn't have to move any walls around. They didn't have to reorder cabinets because they didn't fit into the allotted space. And they had never seen that before. This was a first in their experience. And that's purely due to the fact that they were using robotic layout. And so that is the value prop that we've discovered we can bring to the industry. So that's where we are right now. Let me zoom out a bit and talk about our vision for the future. So construction today, um, I think of it as a manufacturing process. It's a lossy communication driven manufacturing process. People are making phone calls all the time. They're pushing paper documents around and this is how work gets done. Uh, most of the work is based on coordination between people. Uh, people talking to another in order to uh, collaborate and get things done. And all of that collaboration and coordination, it's all based on information. That information that tells people, what do I install? Where do I need to be? And when do I need to do it? Um, and because we're coming onto the job site at that precise point where that digital world meets the field, we are able to become the uh, information broker for all of that information and essentially turn construction into a data-driven manufacturing process. Just like other industries like warehouses and distribution centers have started leveraging automation and robotics in order to make their processes go a lot faster and a lot smoother. Uh, just as today you can order something from Amazon and get it delivered to your door within two hours, that's a witness to the transformation that robotics and automation has had on those industries. And so we see the potential here to apply robots and data and automation in order to make the same kinds of impact on the construction industry, which traditionally has never been able to take advantage of automation. And so 
Longer term, what I'm imagining is dusty powered construction sites that are creating real time digital models of the work that's being done in the field. Um, and essentially turning this lossy communication driven process into a digitized manufacturing process um, and creating huge gains and, and impacts for the industry. So here's one example of how that could work. Uh, one of the things that we see as, as one of the near term possibilities is actually uh, bringing information back from the field into the digital world and essentially what we say closing the loop. So our technology right now, uh, the, the printing technology is capable of taking a digital model and bringing it out into the field. What if we could bring information from the field back into the digital world and enable everyone who is maybe not physically standing on the job site, but is managing the project, is managing the budget, is managing the workforce and give them information about what's happening where on the field. And so really simple idea, what if as Dusty is printing its layout, what if it's actually augmenting that job site with barcodes, QR codes, fiducials? We could allow a process by which as workers are completing their work, they are actually uh, scanning in those barcodes, figuring out what piece are they installing where and when and by who, and uploading all of this information into the cloud to create a real time uh, digital twin of the work that's happening on that construction site. And then once you have that digital twin, once you have all of that information in the cloud, what that enables is optimization and analytics. It enables machine learning over the data coming off of the construction site. You've never been able to have this kind of data before. That's why no one's really trying to uh, automate it or trying to optimize it. But what if we can take all of that data coming off of the site feed that into uh, any of the, the machine learning systems that are available today and start optimizing the process, optimizing the workflow, optimizing the, the people assigned to the, do the work and create a uh, closed loop system that actually allows these construction projects to go off faster and better um, in a way that's better for people's bodies and safer for them to operate on. So that's our vision for the future. Um, so I just wanted to uh, wrap up. I'll, I'll take questions here. I'm sure there's going to be a fair number of them. Um, I'm going to wrap it up by saying the reason I got here was because I started my career in human-computer interaction, and I got to understand an early stage in my life how important it is to really listen to your customers or listen to your users, understand what their needs are, what their pain points are, and create systems that actually make those pain points better. That's how we got here. Um, I got here by continually iterating over what our customers in the construction industry wanted. Um, I'm treating everything in our company as essentially this kind of iterative process. Um, and uh, everything is, we're, is, is being done with a data-driven mindset where we're asking, what kind of information do we have? How can I make that better? And how can I iterate on our process, on our system, on our product in order to improve and make it better for everyone? Um, so uh, this is our team. Uh, that was our, this is our new brand new office that I'm standing in right now. Uh, we would love to talk to you. If you're interested in learning more, you can find us on the web at dustyrobotics.com or on Twitter at, at dustyrobotics. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking to you and I'm happy to take some questions. Great. Awesome talk, Tessa. That was very, I, I will clap even though no one else can. <laughs> um, so we do have a few questions coming in. I'm sure there'll be more um, just for, for everyone who's watching. Um, please ask your questions in Discord in the channel is called uh, hashtag plenary room Ansible. Um, and yeah, a bunch are coming in as I'm watching right now. So, um, so I'll just go with, with the first one that's here. Um, so uh, I think this was from Jasper. Uh, what are some challenges that the Dusty Robotics team had when it came to designing interactions and control between the robot and the workers on the floor? Yeah, so you know, one of the things that we had to learn was um, how do we interact with the people on the job site? Um, you know, going in, when we were thinking about building a Roomba for construction, right, the reason the Roomba idea was really exciting and, and, and uh, 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 we thought it was, would, would be uh, easier to solve was because it could operate at night. 
right? On, at night, there's no one on the floor. You don't have to interact with anyone. You don't have to uh, coordinate with other people on the job site. It's a much easier problem to solve technically. And so that was one of the reasons why we were pursuing that idea. The, the value wasn't there, so we decided to, to switch. And at Dusty, one of the biggest challenges we have is dealing with existing, existing conditions on site. Um, typically, we'll show up on a floor and um, the floor hasn't been, sometimes the floor hasn't been cleared for us, sometimes it hasn't been swept, sometimes there are people in the way, sometimes there are a lot of people in the way. Um, and so one of the things that we've had to learn as a team is how do you, how do you deal with that? And so one of the first things that we did was actually um, uh, 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 hire a team of construction people, uh, project engineers, to actually start operating our robots for us. So instead of having my engineers go out onto a job site and figure out how to speak construction, we actually hired people from the industry who had grown up in this industry and knew how to interact with the people on the floor and uh, knew how to get people out of our way. They have loud voices, they're comfortable standing up to foremen who are, you know, six feet tall and very overweight. Um, and uh, they are able to essentially smooth the way for a new technology to come onto a job site and uh, and actually interact with the people on that job site in a way that allows no one to feel threatened by new technology that's that's coming their way, but actually makes them feel included in uh, uh, in this process of getting new technology out into the world that's going to make everyone's lives better. That was great. You answered several other people's questions in that same answer, so that was that was great. Um, another one here is. Um, so this is from Peggy Chi. One advantage of doing academic research is that we are inventing and exchanging the latest technologies and ideas in the community. However, often the ideas can also be, you know, too early for consumer markets. Mm -hmm. um, can you share your thoughts of balancing between the tech, the people, and the timing to get to market? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the th one of the things that we thought a lot about uh, when we were when we were starting Dusty was what's the right balance of, of new tech, right? You know, things that are kind of frontier, like they, they haven't quite been solved yet. They're, they're not uh, fully commercialized yet and useful to our clients. Um, and we had to find the sweet spot that would actually take technology that can be built in the next, you know, near-term timeframe, like a year or two, and a problem that people actually wanted us to solve. And trying to find that intersection was actually probably the hardest thing about starting Dusty. And so it you know, takes a lot of research, it takes a lot of talking to people. Um, one of the things I realized is that, uh, you know, I, I've talked to many people in the construction industry who have tried to create their own ventures, tried to develop new technology for their own industry. And uh, what they lack is the knowledge about the technology. We came in with the technology, but no knowledge about the industry. And um, I like to say that it's because we came in with a fresh set of eyes that we saw an opportunity to take technology that we knew could be built and use it to solve this problem that everyone knew was a problem, but no one talked about because, um, you know, they, they didn't think it was something doable. Everyone had tried to do it and no one had been able to do it. Uh, and in fact, when I was doing my initial research, no one told me to build a layout robot. It, it just never came up. So we had to actually come in with the right mindset of knowing what's possible, knowing what could be valuable, uh, and a lot of intuition about where value could be created using technology that's near term and, and available, um, almost available, in order to find that right place to start start a company and, and start playing. Um, so here is a the next question. It's actually from our closing keynote speaker, Melody Ivory. Um, so she asks, one of the major concerns that workers have about automation is job insecurity. Um, and you showed where the crew went down from 50 to 36 on a project, um, which is definitely an accomplishment, great for the builder, but any resistance from the workers, any repurposing of workers, you know, how do workers benefit? Yeah, so um, it's, being in the robotics industry, there's, there's always the question of, are you creating tools that are going to take people's jobs? And it's something that, you know, even when I started at Savvy Oak or even back at Willow Garage, it's, it's constantly something that people who are working in robotics are, are keeping in mind. And our solution at Dusty, and what we're realizing at Dusty is that we're not actually building automation that takes people's jobs. We're building power tools 
that let people do their jobs better. And um, it's kind of akin to introducing a powered screwdriver, right? No one wants to go back and using a manual screwdriver if there's an impact driver available. And it's the same with our robot. Uh, once the people who are typically on their hands and knees, getting their hands dirty with chalk dust and dirt, uh, once they start realizing that instead of doing that, they can use a robot, they can stand up and, and operate a tablet and use a you know PlayStation joystick to control this thing. And they don't have to be down crawling on, their, on, on the floor anymore to do their job. And this robot does it faster than they could and it does it more accurately so they don't have to worry about making mistakes. They love it, right? So we're essentially giving the industry a power tool that is giving people superpowers to do something that they could never do before. So in terms of the people who are directly using our product, they are the ones who are most directly benefiting from it. Um, and then in terms of the larger industry, you know, questions about automation, the thing is that if we can make construction more cost-effective, that means that uh, there's going to be more construction, right? There's a limited number of dollars out there by companies who are trying to build buildings. Uh, if they can only build one building for the cost, you know, they're only going to build one building. If they could take that same number of dollars and build two buildings, they'll build two buildings. So um, what that means for the industry is that by making the industry more efficient, we're actually going to increase the amount of work that's available for the workers out there because the entire industry is going to benefit from increased productivity. Um, I don't know if you've seen the chart from McKinsey. There's a famous chart that everyone in the construction industry has seen about how construction productivity is the only industry that's declined over the last 50 years. All of the other industries have shot up because they've adopted robotic automation. And so construction is the last one to start adopting innovation and technology. And by doing this, we're actually going to make the industry more productive and create more jobs for everyone. That's cool. I didn't actually know about that last point. That's that's really interesting. Um, one question I guess I had following on this, uh, and, and you probably understand the dynamics of the construction industry much better than I do, but um, I guess I kind of assume that like the Bay Area, California areas where I think you mostly operate right now are probably less unionized. Whereas like if you went back to like New York City, let's say they're probably much more unionized. Do you think that's gonna be a, a factor that you're gonna run into at some point? Yeah, so it turns out that actually the Bay Area is, is, is fairly unionized. Uh, it's not as bad as New York City or Boston, but it's, it's, uh, it's pretty unionized and um, that was actually one of the challenges that we had to navigate early on at Dusty. Um, the unions would see our tool and they would think that we are replacing the, the workforce uh, that, uh, or, or replacing the jobs that were being done by some members of their unions. And so one of the conversations that we had early on was, look, we're not going to take anyone's jobs. We're building a power tool, right? The same way that your carpenters are on site today and you're not giving them manual screwdrivers, you're giving them powered screwdrivers, right? or the way that instead of using a measuring tape, they're now starting to use a laser level uh, in order to, to get more precise measurements. Um, that is the way the technology is going. We're building tools that allow these workers to do their jobs with less strain on their bodies. And they started realizing that this was going to be something that's gonna benefit the industry rather than uh, threaten it. And so we've actually gotten our biggest adoption through working with the unions who are championing us to their members as something that's going to make all of their lives a lot easier. Interesting. Um, so changing gears a little bit, um, and I think there are a couple of questions like this one, but I'll, I'll go with this one first. Um, what does the human robot team look like? Um, is the robot, you know, set and forget, or are the robot and operator collaborating closely? You know, and so for example, is there a human double checking and signing off on measurements or something, or like how does that work? Yeah, so this is another example of, um, of iteration in the design uh, through, through ethnography. So when we first started designing this robot, we thought, um, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could set up a robot, have it work overnight, uh, everyone leaves, goes home, and then comes back the next day and poof, the entire floor is laid out. It's like a fairy came and sprinkled layout all over the floor. Um, but it turns out that when we actually started talking to customers about that, you know, yes, people are still starting, are, are still asking for it, but as soon as we start talking to them through the realities of, of um, how the system would work and whether that would be a good idea or not, they quickly realize they don't actually want that. Um, and so we could have actually gone down this route of trying to build, it's, it's a really hard task. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty uh, uh, engineering intensive task to create something that's fully 100% autonomous. Um, we could have done that, but 
after talking to customers, we were able to re-scope the problem and design it such that there is always an operator. So the way the system works right now is that there's the um, there's there's three parts of the system. There's the total station, which is that thing on the tripod you saw in the video. There's the robot, and there's a tablet. And that tablet is used by the operator, which is typically a union member who's um, picking that up and, and controlling the robot to do its job. Um, and uh, right now, the robot in most cases is fully autonomous. It can do its own job, um, but there are times when that operator needs to get involved. And usually they're getting involved when they need to coordinate with other people on the site. Uh, the robot works so fast that it only, it can do like an entire chunk of the floor at once and then it needs to move on to the next chunk of floor. And in order to get there, people need to move materials around, they need to coordinate with other trades. And so it's not even feasible to have the system go fully autonomously because it runs out of stuff to do, and then it needs people to help it get to the next stage so that it can move on and do more work. Um, and so we realized that that human in the loop interaction is not only easier technically to solve, but it's actually what our customers want. And so that's how we've designed the system. Gotcha. Um, so here's a, Perhaps, perhaps too future looking of a question, but um, so I assume that the same layouting that happens on floors would also be necessary for walls, um, like remodeling an existing house. Is that something you're considering extending to? Mm -hmm. So um, there are there are different. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually reading the question here in the in the document. So um, I think the question is really about uh, horizontal layout on the floor and vertical layout in the walls. So a lot of stuff, if you look at, you know, some of the, if you've ever been on a construction site, you know that stuff gets installed into the walls, like the electrical outlets, the light switches, the cabinets, you know, those all get mounted at some level above the floor. And so um, at first, when we were specking out this problem and trying to figure out what kind of a robot would we need to build, we thought, oh no, you know, we're going to have to build something that can scale the walls and climb up and make marks on the vertical surfaces in order to be successful. But then we did more research and we discovered that the vast majority of layout actually happens on the floor. Um, so even if you're laying out, for example, a outlet a light switch, um, someone will mark on the floor exactly where it's supposed to go and the height above the floor that it's supposed to be installed at. And that marking on the floor is actually what's used to install that outlet. So we realized pretty quickly that we um, that solving just the problem of doing layout on the ground would actually be enough to, uh, to cover the vast majority of cases. Um, even things that get installed in the ceiling, they get first get marked on the floor, and then they use a plumb laser to transfer that, uh, that location up to the ceiling for installation. So the vast majority of things that happen inside of buildings actually get marked on the floor first. And so it's possible to design a solution that covers the vast majority of those use cases. That's interesting. I thought what you were going to say is that they marked like the, the wall piece on the floor and then they picked it up and put it on the wall. <laughs> but actually, I think what you said makes much more sense. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, I think I'll ask this question from Mira. So it looks like uh, you had to learn a lot about business and a new industry as part of your work uh, on Dusty. Do you always want to be an entrepreneur and lead a company? Um, and what's been the hardest or most surprising and interesting thing about the transition from researcher to entrepreneur? Uh, cool. Hey, Mara. Um, so I never thought I would be an entrepreneur. Uh, I mean, Jeff probably knows this from back when we were working at IBM. You know, I thought I would probably retire at IBM, you know, work for a big company the rest of my life. Um, and so it, it took a couple of like uh, kind of surprise hairpin turns in my career to get me to this point. Uh, one of the things that I realized um, after uh, a couple of years of doing this entrepreneur thing is that it's, uh, I didn't know it before, but I think I've actually got the best job in the world. Uh, I, I love what I'm doing. It's, it's kind of like the culmination of all of the skill sets that I've ever developed, both at IBM managing teams, as well as, you know, technology, working in robotics, working in end user programming, working in HCI, and it's pulling all of those things together and creating a really interesting set of problems for me to learn about and solve. Um, what probably made me take the leap was uh, realizing that being an entrepreneur is really just like playing a video game. And, you know, most, most people don't win the game. There's a lot of people that try and not a lot of people succeed. And at, uh, at the last company that I was at, Savio, I felt like we got really close to winning the game. 
And uh, it wasn't a game that I ever thought I'd be interested in playing. But after having gotten into it and seeing what the what the levels are, you know, what the next big boss is going to be, I just got really interested. I got hooked. And I decided, you know, if uh, if this is out there and it's possible to win this game, I'm going to give it a shot and try to win it. I, I learned fast. And so I was able to learn from all of the things that I've done before and put them into play in this new role uh, of running this company. And it's been a blast so far. So I don't think I'm ever going to go back. All right, so we have about five minutes left. So we'll do one or two, maybe, well, we have three more questions in the list right now. Uh, we'll see how many we get to, I guess. Um, one I think is particularly interesting. So um, how does the Dusty Robotics team and the construction workers like negotiate responsibilities when the robots, or I guess it, what it says, the question says, when robots make minor or critical errors, but I guess maybe it'd be better to generalize that to when errors occur, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So errors, errors, errors can always happen. Um, but the interesting thing about this industry and about the product that we're building is that we've defined the uh, the scope of the job that our robots do to make it pretty resistant to errors that are our fault. Things can always go wrong, and when they do, they're probably because of an input to the system that was incorrect. So what we tell our clients is that we need three things. We need uh, CAD, which is the, the digital file. We need control, which is the points on the ground that are at known locations so we know where we're supposed to go. And we need a clear floor. And when those three conditions are not met, then it's like garbage in, garbage out, right? You, if you are providing bad data to the system, it's going to print that bad data. Uh, a printer doesn't do spell check on the documents that it's printing. And so our system is not going to fix any errors in the data that you're giving it. And so the vast majority of errors that we've seen when our system prints what someone thinks is the wrong thing can be traced back to something that was wrong in the data that we were given. In fact, all of the cases that we've seen. And so uh, the nice thing about robots is that they're, they're, they're pretty repetitive. I mean, robots exist to do the same thing over and over and over again. And we get that benefit on a job site. So um, basically, if you set our system up and you program in uh, you know, what it's supposed to do and you do that again and again, it's gonna keep doing the same thing again and again. That's the definition of robotic. So um, the, the way we've been able to resolve this issue is just trace it back to where's that data coming from and is that what our clients really wanna see on the floor? This is actually part of our value chain that we're actually looking to expand out into. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity here to make this even better for the industry, but that's uh, at the point that we are right now, we've already got a solution that people understand the limitations of it and they can work within those limitations. Gotcha. Um, so next question from Olivia. Uh, I'm so intrigued by how the robot lays ink on the dusty floor. Was this challenging and what are the considerations to achieve this? Did you consider using lasers to project the layout on the floor? Yeah. Uh, so actually, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about competitors. Uh, there's, there's a couple different types of competitors that we have out there. One of the main uh, categories of competitors is, is light projection systems, which is basically a laser with a bunch of rotating mirrors that can actually project, draw in, with lasers, uh, the, the layout on the floor. Uh, the, our customers tell us it doesn't work because if you get your head in front of the beam, it blocks the beam and you can't see what you're trying to build. Um, so uh, we, we didn't consider using lasers. But the way we do ink, um, early on in Dusty's history, uh, the two biggest technical challenges that we had to solve were accuracy and printing. Like how do we get a system that is millimeter precise, because that's what our clients need, and how do we actually make marks on the floor? Uh, we looked at what people were doing today. They use Sharpies, they use these chalk covered string lines, um, they use spray paint in cans. And so we considered all of those options, but none of those actually would have created the, the, would have been able to let us deliver on the vision that we had about bringing all sorts of information out onto the job site. Uh, you're not going to create IKEA instructions with concrete, uh, with, with, with spray paint. So um, we quickly decided on using uh, printer technology. Uh, the printer that's used in our product is actually based on an ink cartridge, similar to what you have in your printer at home. And we have two of those mounted in the robot. And as the robot's driving along, it's actually spraying that ink out onto the ground. And that allows us to print uh, text, to print shapes, to print pretty much any kind of information 
that you might actually want to see on the floor. Um, and it took us several iterations of, of technology to get to the point where we are today. Um, and that was actually one of the interesting things we've learned was how to do that successfully. Gotcha. Um, all right, well, there are still some questions left, but uh, we are pretty much to the end of the time period. I wanna make sure that people go and attend the paper sessions that we have coming up next. So I think we'll wrap it up there, but Tessa, thank you so much for, um, for coming and giving this talk, uh, really appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure, I don't know if you have time to, to hang out. I'm sure more people would have questions in Discord um, if you have a chance, so. Absolutely, I'll uh, So thanks again. Thanks, Jeff, and Great. everyone enjoy the conference. Thanks. Bye. Yes. All right, everyone. Um, again, paper sessions start now um, and uh, look forward to seeing you there. And please ask lots of questions. Thanks. Bye.